Welcome everyone to BDO's webinar focused on professional services firms. If we have not already met, I'm Anna Gerald and I'm a tax partner focused on advising professional services firms. So for those of you who are going to already know, BDO is the world's fifth largest accountancy firm and in the world and providing auditing, accounting, taxation services. And we're in over 160 countries with 95,000 people and creeping up. Well, we've been long-standing advisors to the professional services industry and to the national services, national professional services team rather, is one of the largest teams dedicated to the sector. So through our strong sector focus, we work with a full range of clients um, from boutique firms through to large international businesses, including partnerships, privately owned corporates, listed and private equity backed businesses, the full range. Uh, to talk about full ranges, we've got a full range of speakers today, all experts in their areas. So we've got Peter Hemmington, Louise Couples, Chandra Patel and Jackie Roberts. As I say, they're all experts and they're all experts in advising professional services firms. So Peter is one of my partners who advises on transactions and we've worked together on a number of different um, projects uh, for professional services firms, including mergers, acquisitions, disposals. Louise and Chichendra are partner and principals in the professional services team that advises on broad uh, range of matters, <laughs> including specialist matters to on professional services firms and Jackie is an employment tax specialist for professional services firms so all focused on the sector. So today we're going to cover a range of subjects and as I said we've got a packed agenda so I'm speeding through it. So Peter has kindly agreed to talk to us about the UK economy and what that might mean for professional services firms. We're talking through the features of the autumn statement giving a brief update on employment taxes, reminding people on IR35, because that hasn't gone away, electric cars and CSOPs. And we're also covering a very topical point around basis period reform, which a number of professional service firms are scratching their heads about. And then finally, at the end, we'll pick up questions. So I do encourage you to ask the questions as you're picking them through your mind as we go through the webinar. Please use the Q&A feature, which um, may be at the top of your screen, but it's definitely somewhere. Um, and we'll pick up as many as we can at the end. And if the time doesn't permit, we'll get in contact with you separately because we need to make sure that we will finish within the hour. So as you already know, we'll, we are recording the webinar and we're going to share with you the slide deck as well as the recording in a few days. So first up, without further ado, it's Peter. Over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, and good morning everybody on the call. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? Um, so I'm an M&A advisor, and I've done quite a lot, as Anna has said, in the professional services world. Uh, but one of the things I also do for BDO is that I speak on economic matters. And for 20 years or so, um, I led something called the BDO Business Trends Report, which is a, a kind of poll of polls of all the kind of key economic forecasts that are out there. Uh, which um, we, we know that, that uh, lots of people use because it's a very good macro indicator of where the economy is at. We won't be doing business trends today, but I thought we'd just do a whistle-stop tour uh, through, firstly, go through the um, what, what the Office for Budget Responsibility has been saying in the context of the autumn statement, and then just talk a little bit about some of the key strengths of the UK economy uh, and focus in a little bit uh, on the professional services world, which um, as I'm sure you know is a, is a key sector for, for the UK. So uh, there are four charts here, they're all quite small, for which I apologise. Uh, but these, I think, are, uh, are some of the key uh, charts that the OBR included in their uh, November Outlook report, which accompanied the statement. Um, the first is that that very simple uh, forecast of GDP growth going out to 2028. And you can see that the yellow line is the March 2022 forecast, which is the last time the ABR did a forecast. Um, and the, 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 the darker lines are, uh, the, the, don't worry about the dotted line, but effectively the, the darker line is the November 2022 forecast. But what does this tell us? Uh, I suppose firstly, both in the case of the March forecast and the current one, 
uh, we were headed for a period of relatively slow growth uh, over the rest of the decade. Um, you can see that the growth in sort of all alliances is fairly shallow. Unfortunately, uh, since March, the, the, the UK's economic circumstances uh, have become less positive, uh, and you can see that the growth to that line is lower than it was in March, uh, and we're, it looks like we're going to have something, a recession, which wasn't been forecast in March. And we'll come back to the reasons uh, for, for that um, when we look at the last two graphs on this slide. Secondly, uh, the good news um, is that uh, along with Bank of England, the OBR is positive about the outlook for inflation in the UK. Uh, you can see this, the, the second chart on, on the right of the GDP growth uh, chart is a forecast of uh, CPI growth. It's very colourful. It's got the various components of uh, CPI growth forecast over the next, uh, the next period. Um, the important thing about all these colours is that the worry about inflation is that it comes from a variety of different sources. Gas and electricity are clearly the biggest single uh, cause of inflation in the UK at the moment, but it has metastasized into uh, all sorts of other categories of goods. You see food, beverage, and tobacco is also showing quite strong rises, uh, and other tradable goods are also showing uh, strong rises. It, it, Economists don't so much worry about this unless it gets into wages, what they call sticky prices. And the concern is that uh, unless, not, unless something is done, uh, we'll run into a problem whereby we'll get a wage spiral, we'll get rents and house prices going up, um, and therefore you end up with inflation getting very stuck um, into the economy. Once it's stuck, it's harder to get rid of it. Um, and the action that Bank of England has taken in terms of raising interest rates is designed to stop that kind of inflationary spiral happening. It is all quite painful, uh, and the idea of uh, raising interest rates when we're clearly already in uh, a recession is not something that is particularly palatable to any policy advisor or indeed any of us. But it does appear to be the effective medicine that the economy needs in order to make sure that we don't get into an inflationary spiral. Um, the result of that, if everything goes to plan, is that we'll see uh, CPI inflation back to kind of the standard 2% level by something like the first quarter of 2024, that. So we'll have a very marked inflationary spike, uh, but we won't see that spike last for more than 18 months, two years or so. That's the plan. Um, going on to the third chart in the bottom left-hand corner, I, I think what you can see uh, is that what's changed since March uh, is that we expect mortgage rates to go up much more dramatically than they would have done uh, uh, or certainly were expected to do back, back as recently as March this year. Um, is that the fault of the, uh, the quasi quanting Liz Trust budget or, or is it something that would have happened anyway? Difficult to say, but I think there was a very uh, marked spike in interest rates after that budget. And it does appear to have contributed to a move to, towards the normalization of mortgage rates around the levels that we've historically seen in a very short period of time, uh, which economists weren't expecting before. And of course, the impact of this on house prices is going to be negative. So uh, you can see the, the forecast back in March was for a relatively benign uh, impact on house prices. We're now expecting a reasonably sharp fall. And that's quite a marked change. It does have quite an impact on consumer co confidence. There's this concept of what the economists call the wealth effect. If you feel less wealthy, you're less inclined to spend. Uh, and one reason that you're going to feel less wealthy over the next couple of years is that your house won't be as valuable as you thought it was. So that is, that is quite a marked change. It will impact the consumer economy. And um, because the consumer economy is 70% you know, or so of GDP, uh, it clearly affects all of us uh, in, in our working lives as well. So we will see a crimping of economic growth arising from that. Um, the other thing that we haven't seen um, uh, so far is unemployment go up. After the pandemic, there has been uh, a marked fall in unemployment back to levels that are even below the levels that we saw before the pandemic. Um, we're now expecting to see unemployment rise quite sharply. Uh, the peak that the ABR is forecasting uh, is only 5%, which by historical 
measures, you know, is pretty low. Uh, and one of the interesting things we're seeing at the moment is very marked labour shortages in parts of the economy. Of course, by a number of reasons, the departure from the EU and the end of freedom of movement, but also, as I'm sure we've all read, the way in which a number of people have absented themselves from the workforce post-pandemic, uh, particularly in the over 50s age gap, age group, where people have decided they just don't want to work anymore. We'll see how that develops. Certainly, uh, depressed economic circumstances might well attract people back into the workforce. But even if, even if they do come back in, we're not expecting to see a particularly high peak in unemployment uh, and, and, a, and a very low peak by historical standards. So that's some of the key stuff that's been going on in terms of what the OVR expects. Next slide, please. And just to give a bit of context, uh, after all this gloomy news about the short-term outlook of the UK economy, um, let's focus on some of the key strengths of the UK economy. Um, we are reliant, as Mark Carney famously said, on, on the kindest of strangers. Uh, we do run a very significant uh, deficit in, in the trade of goods and services, uh, which is financed by capital contributions from overseas. Uh, you could argue that we, we, we receive lots of capital contributions from overseas, which impacts the exchange rate, which means that uh, we end up importing lots of goods and services from running the deficit. The two are very closely linked. The reason that foreigners are so keen to, to push money into the UK is our strong institutions, the rule of law, centuries of history of very uh, stable government, which many foreigners see as being uh, a very attractive reason to stick money into the UK economy. Associated with that, uh, we have a very open economy. Uh, the, uh, a recent uh, article by Martin Wolf in the FT uh, had a very interesting set of, set of charts showing that, in fact, we're possibly the lowest regulation economy in the developed world, even more lowly regulated than the United States. And we certainly have one of the most efficient labour markets, uh, uh, certainly in G7. Um, so the UK is remains a very good place to do business because of that lack of regulation and the efficiency of the labor market. By G7 standards, we're, we're kind of just a little bit below average in terms of our taxes. So even though the tax burden is going up, we're still a relatively low tax economy. And we do have some uh, very strong, uh, strong sectors that are internationally very competitive. Uh, and, you know, the most prominent of these are the financial services sector and the professional services sector. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute. Plus life sciences and aerospace are often mentioned as well. But professional services is a truly globally competitive sector. UK professional services businesses are amongst the best businesses in the world at what they do. Uh, it's a great place for the professional services industry. Um, and related to, to this sort of basic strength in professional services, we did see a very strong recovery from the pandemic in the professional services market. Uh, next slide, please. So just, a, just a, this is a bit of a complicated chart, but, but essentially what, what it shows is that the chart in the top left shows that we're, we're basically uh, it, we're, we're running a pretty big surplus in, uh, in services generally. More importantly, if you look at the, the charts on the right hand side, um, the top chart shows the sorts of services that we export, and the bottom chart shows the sorts of services that we import. Now, what we're importing is relatively low value add services like travel um, and transport. Uh, there, there, are, there are other services too, but those, those are two of the three biggest types of services that we import. They're very low, they're, re they're re relatively low value add. Compared to the services that we export, which are very high value add, are, and the key ones are financial and, as I say, professional uh, services, professional management consulting, as it says in this chart. So, what we're doing is we're exporting these fantastically high value add services and we're importing relatively low value add services which contributes to, as we'll see on the next chart. Next chart, please. Uh, a very substantial export surplus, uh, export surplus uh, in financial services, other business services, as, as this chart calls it, but that's professional services. So these are the two biggest net export service sectors for the UK economy. Uh, and they, again, they bring home this fact that the UK 
is a superb place for the professional services industry and our professional services businesses are incredibly competitive in the world market. And just one final slide, next slide please. And you can see that the components uh, of employment, it's it split between professional, professional financial services, it's split between the professional services side on the left hand side and banking and financial services on the right hand side. But professional services in terms of employment is rather larger uh, than the banking and financial services sector. So the overall outlook for the economy, it's going to be a difficult couple of years. Um, but if you want to be in any sector in the UK at the moment, professional services is probably the one to be in uh, because it's the sector where foreigners come to buy our services, it's globally competitive uh, and it, it is it's an extremely high quality part of the economy. Yeah, that's me. Thank you, Peter. That's really helpful. Thank you. And then and sets up really nicely to talk further about the services firm today. Much positive note. Okay, so um, after we said to Kendra, can you pick up from here when you're talking about the autumn statement? Thank you, Anna. Um, and thanks to Peter uh, for that interesting presentation and uh, good morning to everyone in our audience today. Um, so as Anna mentioned in this segment, I'm going to be covering uh, the autumn statement, uh, the main points coming out of Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's uh, uh, statement on 17th of November. Um, it's certainly been a turbulent time. Uh, we've had three prime ministers and four chancellors just within the last six months. Um, Hopefully we'll never see that again, <laughs> but undoubtedly it's been very difficult to keep on top of all of the tax changes that have happened uh, or being announced and then uh, the U-turns that have been uh, talked about after that uh, and then further tax changes. So very difficult to keep on top of what's going on. So uh, today I'm going to set out what the current position is uh, in terms of tax changes, uh, focusing on those areas that are of most interest to our professional services sector um, clients and contacts. Next slide, please, Jade. So Peter spoke um, about the economic outlook um, in lots of detail, but I thought it'd be worth a quick recap just to provide a little bit of context around the autumn statement announcement. Um, so Jeremy Hunt, he spoke about the unprecedented global headwinds, uh, including the impact of COVID-19 on government borrowing levels uh, and the ongoing war in, in Ukraine, which is fueling a surge in energy and food prices. Um, Peter talked about the Office of uh, Budget Responsibility Forecasts, which accompanied the autumn statement and it's, and it's fair to say it presented a, a pretty bleak picture um, with inflation hitting a 40-year high um, of 11 percent due to rising energy food and other goods prices um, interest rates have gone up to the highest rate since we've seen since the 2008 financial crisis uh, and that's um, as peter mentioned with the bank of england and other central banks around the world uh, trying to uh, control inflation by increasing those interest rates um, government borrowing is set to hit 177 billion this year, uh, and that's approximately 80 billion higher than was forecast by the OBR back in March, uh, with the increased cost of borrowing um, having a significant impact. Um, and GDP is falling. Um, as Peter said, we're now uh, in a recession. Um, and what's probably of most immediate concern to people is that living standards, which is based on disposable income, uh, is to fall by 7% over this year and next. Uh, so this is um, how people actually feel in terms of the pound in their pocket. Um, and that, that fall is actually wiping out the previous eight years of growth that we've had over this period. Um, so people are, are you know, expecting to feel the pinch. It's the cost of living crisis that everybody's talking about. Um, so without wishing to depress people too much, uh, I picked out a quote there from the IFS Institute of Fiscal Studies. Uh, he said, the truth is we just got a lot poorer. Um, so quite a bleak picture. Um, Following, you know, hopefully a positive message from Peter there actually within our professional services sector, we're quite well, um, you know, positioned uh, despite the bleak picture overall. Yeah, and, and just gender people continue to need advice, don't they? Um, have there been any measures kept by um, the budget announced by Quasi Carton? Uh, yes, they have. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of um, the if you recall, there was a, a national insurance increase, um, badged as a health and social care levy, which added 1.25% uh, to national insurance, and that was employers and employees, NICs, uh, as well as class four NICs for self-employed. Um, now that has actually been uh, reversed, so that was List Trust and Quasi Carteng, so they wanted to reverse that. It had a broad agreement uh, across the across the, uh, the House of Commons, um, so actually that that measure was. Um, 
push through in November. Um, so the employer, um, uh, employment and employers plus um, self-employment NIC rates have actually uh, gone back down. So um, in terms of um, employees, um, because generally that's on a, pay, a weekly or a monthly payroll, um, those changes had already have taken effect. Uh, with self-employed people uh, who pay class four NICs on an annual basis as a special blended rate just for this year, uh, and then it'll revert to the normal levels from next year. Um, so, uh, but a point to note, however, is that the additional 1.25%, uh, which was added to dividend tax rate, uh, which was all part of the same measure effectively of adding 1.25%, has, has actually uh, not been reversed, uh, and there's there's no intention to reverse that. So actually, um, even though NIC rates have, have gone back to the previous levels, uh, dividend tax rates are still at this higher uh, level. Okay. Go on to the next slide, please, Jade. Okay, so turning to the, uh, the government's objectives uh, for the autumn statement, uh, the Chancellor spoke about significant gap uh, opening up between government receipts and spending and of the plan to uh, tackle the current cost of living crisis and to rebuild the economy. Um, he set out three priorities, stability, growth and protecting public services. Um, he clearly wished to demonstrate a, a clear break from the previous list trust of quasi carting administration uh, and the, the, what we call the own goals they committed. Um, he confirmed there'd be no unfunded tax cuts, which you know people uh, blamed for the, for the shock uh, caused by those announcements, uh, and nearly all of the measures announced in the growth plan less than two months earlier uh, being reversed. Um, so this includes the most controversial measure, which was the abolition of the 45% additional tax rate for the highest earners, uh, and other measures that have, have been reversed, so the 1% reduction in the basic rate uh, of tax, uh, as well as um, retaining the 19% corporation, 19 uh, 19 corporation tax rate, which I'll come on to in, in the next slides. Um, the Chancellor, I, th I thought he used some quite creative uh, language. It was a term I hadn't heard uh, used before, but he talks about consolidation of 55 billion uh, to talk about how they're going to uh, uh, increase uh, government receipts through uh, tax increases. Uh, so that would be about half of that 55 billion consolidation. Uh, and the other savings would be from uh, spending cuts. Um, the, and the overall message seemed to be um, that the, the current government wanted to calm the markets uh, and spread the pain uh, of this uh, 55 billion consolidation over what they call their scorecard card period. So that's um, 2022, 23, uh, which is this financial year uh, to 27, 28. Um, particularly notable, I think, that much of the, the pain is through stealth tax increases, which I'll come on to uh, on the next slide. Uh, but we're talking about uh, changes uh, which don't necessarily. Uh, flag as, as increases in tax rates and such. Uh, and also a lot of a lot of this pain will be pushed uh, to after 2024, which we all know is when the next general election is scheduled to take place. Uh, so there's perhaps a view to trying to fly under the radar a little bit uh, in terms of what's going on with tax yeah. increases. <clears throat> um, if you go on to the next slide, please, Jade. Okay, so I'll cover the, um, the, the changes in personal tax. Um, so, this was perhaps a, a symbolic uh, move, uh, but rather than abolish the additional rate band, which um, List Trust and Kwasi Kwarteng has uh, decided to pursue, uh, it will be retained and actually um, it, it will now have a reduced threshold. So that threshold is coming down from 150,000 uh, to 125,140 pounds uh, from 6th of April, 2023. Um, if anyone's wondering why it's such a specific figure, uh, this is because uh, the the amount there is the um, <coughs> is where an individual's personal allowance is, is tapered down to nil. Uh, so if, if people are aware, the amount between 100,000 and 125,000 and 140 pounds is already taxed at 60% due to the loss of uh, personal allowance. Um, so you lose one pound for every two pound of income over 100,000 until it's fully fully tapered down to nil. Uh, for someone who's earning 150,000 or more per year, the change means additional tax of about uh, 1,200 pounds. Um, and just a, a point to note here is that the change applies to all uh, income for taxpayers in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, the position is more complicated in Scotland, uh, so it will apply automatically for savings and dividend income there. Um, however, the Scottish Government sets the rates and thresholds for other income, um, so that could be, could be different. Uh, but the Scottish Government is expected to announce um, 
uh, what they plan to do with their rates and thresholds uh, within the next few weeks. So we should have a clearer picture then. Um, one thing to just point out though, is that it's unlikely that Scottish taxpayer will pay less tax as, as they already have a higher rate uh, threshold, which is lower, set lower than the rest of the UK. Um, so the so the, the amount of income that's taxed at 40% rather than 20% in, in Scotland um, is more than uh, the tax saving that people would, would, would get if the, uh, the additional rate wasn't brought down to 125,000 in Scotland uh, in line with the rest of the UK. Um, so apart from, apart from that change, um, income tax and NIC thresholds are going to be frozen until April 2028. Uh, so that's uh, two years uh, added uh, to when Rishi Sunak first uh, announced he was going to freeze the thresholds when he was the Chancellor. Uh, and this is the this concept of fiscal drag or you know, stealth taxes. Uh, it means people generally paying more tax uh, compared to what they might have paid uh, if there had been inflationary increases to the thresholds without any increase in headline rates. Uh, so um, and other points uh, to note, uh, dividend allowance. Uh, so this is the, the nil rate ban for, for dividend income. Uh, that's that's going down from t the current 2,000 uh, to 1,000 in April 23, uh, and then down to 500 in April 24. Um, also, the annual exempt amount for capital gains is going to be reduced from 12,300 down to 6,000 in April 23, and then to 3,000 April 24. Um, so this is this is um, taking on board some of the. Um, recommendations that have been made by the Office of Tax Simplification uh, in their um, policy document uh, released a couple of years ago. Um, there were some uh, more drastic changes called for um, amongst uh, many sort of political uh, commentators, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, and there was a, there's been a lot of calls for aligning capital gains tax rates with income tax, and people may have seen that. Um, but so far, this seems to be being resisted and we haven't seen any announcements to that effect or, or any, uh, you know, Anything suggests that this will be happening anytime soon, but then we never know what will happen. That's the, you know, <laughs> that as, as, as always the case with tax policy. Um, so there may be changes in the future, but nothing announced as yet. Um, inheritance tax uh, rate bans will also be frozen until April 28. Again, that's adding another for, uh, two years to the original proposals. Next slide, please, Jade. Okay, so now we're going to just cover the um, the business tax headlines. So, uh, as I mentioned, the main corporation tax rate is going to increase from twenty five percent from April twenty three. Uh, there's some reforms to R and D relief have been announced. Um, so those are coming into effect from April twenty twenty three. Um, the government uh, have said that they consider the the the, uh, the less generous large company uh, RDEC regime uh, provides better value than the the, the current regime for SMEs size uh, businesses. Uh, partly that's because of abuse of the SME regime and people may have seen a lot about, um, you know, some unscrupulous advisors uh, putting in, you know, fraudulent claims effectively in, in HMRC's opinion. Uh, so they want to try and uh, make that less attractive, uh, but also they're saying that's not the only reason they just think they get better value from, from the RDEC and, and, you know, they've seen perhaps they think the SME regime is over generous as it stands. So what they're looking to do is a rebalancing of the regimes to bring them more closely in line. Um, I think the, uh, the suggestion is that they probably will move to a single regime in the future at some point, but in the meantime, they're bringing them close together. Um, so for this SME regime, uh, the, the expenditure uplift um, that, that currently applies. So for every, um, so every, every one pound of expenditure, you get two pound 30 of uh, deduction. Uh, so there's a there's a 130 percent uplift. So that 130 percent is going to be reduced down to 86 percent. Uh, and where you have a loss making company that can claim a repayable credit, um, the value of that is going to go down from 14 and a half percent to 10 percent. Um, now for the for the large company RDEC regime, uh, the headline rate will actually increase uh, from 13 percent to 20 percent. Uh, just some other announcements as well. So it's been confirmed that the annual investment allowance, uh, which is currently at one million on a temporary basis is going to be set at that level permanently. So we'll carry on having the 1 million uh, annual investment allowance um, to, to be able to use. Um, the VAT registration threshold is going to be held uh, at 85,000 until April 26. Uh, and a couple of points around uh, employer um, spending. So employer NIC threshold is going to be frozen at 9,100. Uh, from April 23 to April 28. Um, the employment allowance will remain at 5,000 per year. Um, 
and just to mention as well, so this is not strictly a tax measure, um, but uh, worth flagging is that the national living wage will increase from £9.50 to £10.42 per hour from April 23. Um, so in general, um, salary inflation and more national insurance uh, contributions from employers is going to increase the employment costs for, for businesses overall. Next slide, please, Jade. OK, so I'm just going to cover um, very briefly some of the more technical tax changes happening, uh, just to signpost these for some of the uh, some businesses uh, who might need to consider. Uh, the first two I'm going to talk about apply to large multinational enterprises. So these are um, businesses with global revenues exceeding 750 million euros. Um, the OECD's Pillar 2 recommendation uh, for a multinational top-up tax, uh, and this is where an entity's effective rate in any jurisdiction is below 15%. Uh, will be implemented and that's going to apply to accounting periods beginning on or after 13th of December 23. Uh, the, the second um, change is that uh, multinational enterprises will also have a requirement to prepare and maintain uh, what's described as a master and, and local file um, for transfer pricing purposes uh, and that's again is based on OECD recommendations so that's going to apply for accounting periods beginning, beginning on or after 1st of April 23. Um, so for any businesses that might might need to consider this, we can provide um, further advice in these areas. Um, away from uh, changes for multinational enterprises, uh, there's a change to the share for share exchange rules, uh, which will mean that shares in a non-UK company held by an individual will be deemed to be UK shares, where they've been received in exchange for shares in a UK company. Uh, so this is designed uh, to block non-DOMs from being able to use remittance spaces um, to avoid UK tax on gains and dividends. Uh, and it's uh, the point to note is that it applies to trans transactions on or after 17th of November 23. So that's the date of the autumn statement. Um, so that change came in with immediate effect. Um, so that brings me to the end of my section. Um, I will hand you over to my colleague, uh, Jackie Roberts, who's going to talk uh, a bit more about employment taxes. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, can we have the next slide, please, Jade? OK, so a um, couple of things um, that are definitely worth talking about in the employment tax arena here. So. Um, the IR35 or the off payroll labour uh, rules that are both in the private sector and the public sector, but of course that's not relevant here, are here to stay, or at least for the foreseeable future. Kwasi Kwarteng did repeal the IR35 legislation, but it was firmly brought back into um, view by Jeremy Hunt, who cancelled the repeal. So we are back on the agenda. What that also does, I think, is... Um, highlight that it has been something the government have been thinking about and therefore will be on the agenda of HMRC in terms of making sure that they receive the correct amounts of PAYE and NIC from these rules. From uh, April 23, the light touch that has been applied to penalties where there is a PAYE and NIC liability um, will no longer apply. So for the first year, 21-22, there's a slightly soft landing in terms of compliance. There was less, there was less compliance taking place um, by HMRC. They were concentrating on the public sector. Um, and uh, where they did find any arrears, um, they were essentially taking that light touch. So in some circumstances, not actually charging penalties at all. That is no longer the case. And what we will see is penalties starting at around 15% up to 30% if there's any PAY and NIC risk. So what that means is uh, we need to be thinking about um, where those risks are. Um, and that will be from the engagement of personal service companies, either indirectly or directly. Not forgetting those self-employed, um, and agency workers and any directors that are maybe paid on a direct basis. We also know um, just recently that HMRC have been um, ramping up their activity in the area of IR35. So um, we have seen recently some letters from HMRC that are being sent to 
uh, clients, which are, are completely stating that they are not conducting an employer compliance review. Um, it's bold at the top of these letters, but it says that what we would like you to do is to confirm within 30 days that all of your off payroll labour has been assessed, uh, either employed or self-employed <coughs> correctly. And then also to confirm within 30 days that they all of those individuals that were deemed employed via your assessment have indeed been put on the payroll. It then continues to say, uh, we're not, uh, although we're, this is not going to be an employer compliance review, should we need to do a review or should we carry out a review after this time, um, then there may be penalties. So we can see that the activity is ramping up with these effectively nudge letters that are being sent. So we've got that and obviously the uh, not so light touch in uh, penalties. So I think what we need to do is think about how it is that um, we we uh, design um, processes to ensure that those penalties aren't sought. So what you're looking at is providing services, uh, sorry, providing um, uh, processes that take reasonable care. Um, you're looking at ensuring that you have a good identification process for your personal service companies. Remember, that's directly engaged, which is much easier to identify and indirectly. So one would say that you might need to interrogate the purchase ledger to ensure that you are identifying everyone, that you've got a good assessment process. A lot of, in, a lot of uh, um, companies are actually using HMRC's CES tool. It does have some drawbacks, but um, because it can be relied on if the data that goes in is correct and the answers that come out um, are correct. Um, a lot of uh, businesses are using that. We would also say that you need to have, <coughs> excuse me, um, you would have a review process. So if every, every year, um, if you've had um, contractors still on the, on the books or being paid on a self-employed basis, that those are reviewed and that there were robust policies and processes in place for demonstrating that there is reasonable care. Next slide, please, Jade. So one of the other changes um, in the statement was regarding benefits and kind on company cars. Um, and in fact, for uh, electric cars, there was an increase in the uh, percentage that is going to be applied to uh, those cars. However, the increases in those um, benefits in kind are still very favourable when compared to petrol and diesel cars. So what we would see is that that's an, you know, it's an incentive, obviously, to take up electric cars. Um, what, the, what they're actually going to do is increase the, um, the, the value which you apply to the list price of a company car by 1% for each of the years. But also what that means is that we know um, what those percentages are going to be up until 27, 28. And therefore, if anyone is thinking about implementing or providing electric cars as part of an employer package, then you know what those benefits will be. You know what the calculations will be in terms of uh, employees. So a little bit of stability there. Um, and also there will be the increase in uh, the normal cars, 1% um, in 25, 26. And uh, that will be up to a maximum of 37%. Um, and that's fixed to 26, 27 and 27, 28. They seem such far away years, don't they? But what that actually means is we've got a, a perfect time to think about um, salary sacrifice in cars. Um, uh, there's a saving to be made for uh, employees and employers on the tax and the national or the tax for the individual and national insurance for the employer. Um, and those savings can be anything from one to three thousand pounds per uh, car. So definitely worth thinking about doing some modelling uh, if you are considering company cars. Uh, next slide, please. State. So the final couple of points um, 
the national insurance uh, rate bands have um, frozen, as Jitendra pointed out, and that's up until April 28. But what's important, or not what's important, but what's noticeable here is that this includes the upper earnings limit that has also been frozen. So what that actually means is that individuals that are in the upper rate band will pay, be paying more at just the 2% rather than the 12%. So it's a possibility that the government might think about um, addressing that and changing uh, that in the future. So just watch this space for that one. And then um, on the final point, we have company share option plans. Some good news there for our colleagues in the share plans incentives team. And obviously we've got some corporates as well as um, LLP um, businesses out there. And what we have with the company share option plan is um, that the amount that is the value of the shares that can be granted uh, to each employee uh, that was 30,000 has from April 23 increased to 60,000. There are also some more um, favourable conditions that can um, be used in order to uh, provide con company share option um, to employees. So good news all round. So uh, that was a whistle stop on uh, employment tax. I'm going to hand you over to Louise Couples, who's going to speak about basis period reform. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Excellent. Um, yeah, so thanks, Jackie. Um, thanks, Anna. And yeah, good morning. Good to be with you on this nice crisp winter morning. Um, yeah, so uh, moving on to basis period reform. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Jade? So it feels like, um, if, if, if you're anything like me, it feels like we've been talking about this for so long and waiting for updates. And finally, we've got one. Um, and perhaps best to gloss over the fact that it's a rather disappointing update, um, but we are where we are. To recap then, um, so in response to lobbying, um, and um, we know sort of that a lot of businesses have put quite a lot of effort into responses, et cetera, to HMRC. Um, so HMRC had undertook to review how it would support businesses who can't change their year end 31st of March and hence will be required under basis period reform to deal with the issue of having to estimate results and amend provisional returns. Um, and so nearly a year later, um, and we are still technically in autumn, which runs through to 21st of December, if anyone else was wondering, um, we've got the outcome of HMRC's review. And what HMRC have agreed to do is to move the requirement for amendments to provisional figures to be made um, as soon as possible. Um, and instead, what will be permitted is that you would be able to amend the returns during the usual amendment period. Um, so hence, when you file your following year's tax return. Um, so in essence, um, this isn't really going to provide any help for businesses at all. Um, I'm not sure I've seen at any time a partnership amend figures outside of the usual amendment period. Um, so while it is very disappointing um, and frustrating that a lot of businesses have put the effort into responding to HMRC on this, um, and we aren't really any further ahead 12 months on, um, I think we can at least draw a line under the position um, and move on and plan ahead. I think it is worth saying that we are continuing to engage with HMRC on the rules. And what has been clear through our discussions with them is that anything which requires an amendment to the legislation, um, so points such as changing filing dates or incorporating adjustments in the following year's returns, is quite hard for HMRC to do um, without changes to tax legislation, which takes time. Um, but they are able and amenable to considering updates or clarifications to the guidance. Um, so we have asked HMRC for some more guidance on um, areas such as what extent they would expect businesses to go to if they're needing to estimate figures. Um, and then also interaction with some of the more technical points on issues such as double tax relief. Um, and we will be meeting with HMRC early next year. Um, so do feedback to us um, if there are points to raise, which it would be helpful to have incorporated into the guidance. 
Um, and I think before we move on to talking about what it is we should be doing next, um, it's good just to pause and focus on the issue of spreading um, of the transitional profit and what to do um, with that. Um, and to recap that with no action, then spreading is the default. Um, but an election not to spread is made on the individual partner returns. So I know that some firms are looking at whether they can um, make it a policy or a requirement um, that partners do spread, um, but ultimately it will be an individual decision. Um, so I think the earlier you can have those conversations with your partner groups and get a sense of what it is they want to do um, and then work out based on that whether you're going to have funding to meet your January 2025 tax payments, the better. Yeah, and Louise, there's a sort of common question around all of this, isn't there, around, you know, should we spread, should we not spread? If we do choose to spread, will they regret that if the tax rates probably go up, depending on, you know, the government of the day? Yeah. Have you got a view on that? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think if tax rates go up, the way the spreading provisions work is that at any time during the five year spread, um, you can elect to accelerate your out remaining tax. So if there was an anticipation of a tax rate rise um, and the um, income tax rate rises would come in at the, usually come in at the start of the at the tax year that you should have time through the individual tax returns to make the relevant elections and accelerate your tax at that point. Um, but I think it sort of comes back to that trying to sort of flush out decisions early and have thinking and sort of stress testing your funding requirements because if it does look like if, you, if you've negotiated your facilities with the bank etc on the basis that partners will spread um, and then down the line if there's a tax rate rise you need to change that um, I think just sort of stress testing that you've got the headroom to be able to make um to to uh, sort of meet those meet meet those payments yeah yeah and especially as entering into a recession and where cash flow might be a bit tighter in terms of payments of you know your your sort of outstanding invoices and all that sort of stuff so a lot of uncertainty yeah, yeah. can I have the next slide please jade um we just wanted to focus now then on um, what it is that we're recommending businesses do at this point. Um, and I think the first point is um, just really to get to grips with what basis period reform means on an individual partner basis. Um, so sort of stress testing under different scenarios, what happens if rates go up, et cetera, um, and suddenly partners need to spread. Um, so I know a lot of businesses did some sort of back of the envelope calculations, but I think it is key now to just try and refine those on an individual partner basis. Because I think until you get into that level of detail, um, it's difficult to anticipate the total position. So you might have partners for for example, that can't relieve their overlap at top rates, etc. Um, and I think now we've had the um, announcements from HMRC on the administrative easements, mm -hmm. then you can also bottom down that decision on should you change the partnerships year end. And I think we're expecting for most UK firms that um, they, they would do um, subject to sort of the wider non-tax issues related to changing your year end. Um, although for non-UK um, firms, then that's just not going to be possible due to the international um, dimensions. Making a decision um, on and, and having to think about what communications you need for your partner group. Um, I think that's something that you'd want to pick up on early next year. So even if you aren't um, looking after partners, individual tax returns and you don't tax reserve, uh, maybe there's still an expectation within your partner group um, that you give them the information they need. I mean, I know sort of some partnerships tell partners, put this in this box, put that in that box. Um, so I think um, getting ahead of the game and working out what communications you need for your partner group um, is a good thing to do. And starting to plan your compliance now. Um, so ideally, I think putting a roadmap in place from now up until January 2025. So if, you, if you're looking at returns for the transitional year, which are due January 2025, and you might think, well, summer 2024 is the pinch point. Um, but I think what we're finding is if you sort of map out the process is that it's beneficial to really get accelerating as early as possible. Um, so I'm sure nobody wants to hear this, but once your January returns are in, it's probably the great time to pick up on, if you've got an April accounting date, pick up on your April 22 tax comp and really trying to get ahead of the 
game on that and finalise that Um, because otherwise it's going to end up with this sort of almost impossible position where you've got two years worth of work to do at the same time. Um, And then finally, yeah, just starting to have a think about some of the intricacies on matters such as um, double tax relief, um, which I think will come out as you do those individual partner calculations. Um, And yeah, we're meeting with HMRC um, and their international division on some of these issues early next year. Can I have the next slide, please, Jade? Just touching briefly then on some of the HMRC um, activity we're seeing, and then sort of Jackie mentioned some of the approaches we're seeing on employment tax. Um, And just wanted to pick up on um, a batch of letters that um, HMRC sent out at the end of October to partnerships with corporate members Um, and what those letters were doing um, and they were specifically um, noted as not being a compliance check but it was asking those partnerships with corporate members to check positions under the um, mixed member rules. Um, There's no specific action needed on those letters Um, so I think Jackie mentioned with the employment tax one that a response is needed so so no response to HMRC is needed on that. Um, And this is sort of part of a general approach that we're seeing from HMRC to sort of target batches of taxpayers. Um, And they believe that through doing these sorts of reviews, then they um, get a greater compliance of the rules. So while there isn't a requirement to specifically respond to HMRC, um, I do think it's fair to say that perhaps HMRC might be monitoring those partnerships that receive letters and having a look at tax returns and keeping a closer eye on those. And also that HMRC could use those letters um, perhaps as a strategy in the event there are future inquiries. Um, so, for example, if they did pick up on areas where they believe adjustments are done, then I don't think it would be unfeasible to expect that HMRC might ask the business at that point, oh, well, what did you do when you got these letters? Um, how did you document your position? Um, so I think there's a need to sort of reflect on the letters or sort of document um, sort of advice that you've received on the rules um, to sort of protect positions going forward um, in the event that sort of HMRC asked to see that evidence as part of an inquiry. Yeah, completely agree with Louise. And um, there's, there's a lot of activity to be done. They've got to be on it with the tax teams and perhaps growing the tax teams or taking advice. That's for sure. Thank you, Louise. Uh, are you, is there anything else that you wanted to pick up on? No, I think that's more than enough for today. Lovely. Louise, thank, thank, you, thank you, Anna. Right. So we've got a few questions and we've got a few minutes left. So um, I will get to it. But before I do that, we're just setting our agenda for next year. So all of these webinars we plan out in advance, we make sure that specialists are available, et cetera. And this is our opportunity for the audience to suggest topics that they're particularly interested in. So if there is anything in your mind that you think, oh, why don't BDO cover that? Now's your chance to, to raise it with us. So if you can pop it into the Q&A, if you've got any views on what's particularly important, It doesn't have to be anything different, just something that you find particularly useful on a regular basis or something new that you've not heard us discuss before. Please do put it into the Q&A and we'll take that into account on our agenda for next year. And if you don't get a chance to do it today, if you can message one of us, uh, we'll we'll pick it up um, and make sure it's considered. Okay, wonderful. So whilst people are contributing to that, and we're very grateful for your input, let me um, raise just one or two questions. So there are a few, so uh, I'll see what I can get through. Jachendra, um, bringing us back into your world that you were talking about the different rates, changes, um, quite a lot of change in relation to basis period reform, the administration that goes through it, all of those changes that we've been hearing about, whether the budget or recent changes, how is it changing people's views about what strategy to use um, to house their professional services activities in? You know, should it be an LLP? Should it be a corporate? What, 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 what are people thinking? Yeah, it's, it's an issue that's, that's coming up uh, a, a lot and looking at, you know, just through the tax lens, um, you know, the important point around the difference between partnerships and companies that the partnership profits are only tax funds. So individual partners and pay income tax and, and NICs on their share. Um, and although that can get into a top rate of 47%, this compares quite favourably when you compare it to profits um, that are going to be extracted through a company if you're applying a full distribution policy. So if you take the corporation tax rate, which is going up to 25%, uh, and then dividends, which can get taxed at up to 39.35%, uh, you end up with an effective rate of 54.5%, actually. So that's very high in comparison to the 47%. Uh, 
Um, but of course, you know that the position can be different. So profits are going to be uh, rolled up in the in the company for um, uh, you know use for investment purposes. So you know people might expect they can, they can some of those profits can be extracted you know later, uh, perhaps at the capital gains rates, um, which would bring that effective rate down. Subject, of course, the point I mentioned, which you know tax policy around you know, capital gains and other tax rates can always change and. Uh, so it's very difficult to uh, to come up with a kind of standard answer for every business, and you know I think each business needs to think about what what's the right structure for them. Uh, commercial considerations are obviously you know need to be paramount in this. It's not just about tax. Uh, so we have lots of conversations around you know things like flexibility of partnerships, uh, culture, and things. Uh, um, and and on the other hand, you know com companies often uh, you know a company structure can sometimes be better from an investment point of view. So investors, mm -hmm. uh, things like IPOs and things like that. So um it's not it's not a, not straightforward but you know we can definitely help with with weighing up the pros and cons and uh yeah. and if if somebody want, does want to restructure there's a lot of um uh implications that can arise or you know and sometimes managed um so there's lots of advice around that as well uh something that we're talking to a lot of our um llp clients about at the moment um is about winding up service companies if they have those uh, within their structures um so we're seeing uh, we've had you know multiple conversations with clients and we're helping uh, some of those who, who've decided actually they don't need to have that service company anymore, and especially with the uh, the effective tax rates increasing. So um, mm -hmm. there's uh, certainly a, a bit of a move uh, into thinking about removing those from the structure. Yeah, on that administration point, anything to do to keep the admin down, but the flexibility of exactly. perhaps having both in the structure is uh, something to consider as well. So no clear answer to Chenja, but lots of questions that are very bespoke to each individual client, which is um, difficult to handle, but at least you get a better answer for each client rather than a blanket answer. Um, Jackie, just one very quick one. We've got about 10 seconds to answer it. Um, any tax breaks on for electric vehicles um, in terms of the, the charging points? Uh, yes, um, that wasn't covered actually. So um, what's uh, interesting there is that charging points is not fuel for the purposes of a company car. So um, currently um, there is no um, provision to tax uh, charging points that are provided by employers or where an employer installs the charging point at an individual's home. So uh, good news all round. Hopefully that was only 10 seconds. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all to the speakers. Um, whistle stop tour in each of your areas, but plenty to cover and always more to cover than we've got time. And thank you to the audience for listening. Um, we will circulate the slides and the recording in due course. And please do give us your input about topics that you'd like us to hear um, us talk about. Thank you all.